if we will just take the time to sit and to listen and to initiate that conversation and ask why, I think we find that we have things in common, that we have more commonalities than differences in our lives, whether it be someone from another country, someone from a different background, someone of a different age. I think if we write or if we ask the correct questions and listen to each other's stories, we can find that common bond. Hi, I'm Nora Jones. Welcome to It's About Language. This podcast connects language and culture to life, learning, and hope. You'll experience insightful conversations with creative leaders in the fields of education, business, arts, and science. My guests shed light on the impact of language and culture on individuals and society as they share their stories and experiences. You'll be informed and inspired as we explore how language and culture make us human and bring hope in the midst of a challenging world. And it is a great pleasure to welcome my guest today, Lisa Four. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Nora. I'm so glad to have a chance to talk with you because you and I have had a great history together of professionalism in the world language educational scene. Tell the listeners, your bio is in my website as well, of course, but tell our listeners some about where you work and how you ended up there, how you began there. Well, I'm in my 28th year teaching Spanish in Washington County, Virginia. Um, It was not initially my plan to uh, major in a foreign language and a world language. I wanted to be a history and civics teacher. Hmm. And my dad wasn't quite on board with that. And since he was helping me with my education, um, asked me (laughs) to maybe reevaluate my plans as a teacher. And so to do what I wanted to do and to maybe please him at the time as well, I thought through the situation and decided to teach Spanish, to major in Spanish, um, so that I could continue teaching history and world culture. Oh. And so it's kind of to circumvent the situation and still do my passion and love of teaching history and and civics and culture. you know, but just in a different language. Isn't that interesting? So you came into world language through the door of culture and history. Absolutely. Yes. That was my passion. That was my love. And when you first started doing that, how does it vary when you first started from what you have learned over the 28 years? I think initially the approach was to, to teach some language and to teach a about history and culture. Um, I think that has changed over the years to be more of trying to get my students engaged and to maybe raise their level of of cultural intelligence Hmm. rather than just to teach facts and information about government and history and, and things that have occurred throughout the years. Tell me about cultural intelligence in the world language classroom, as you just expressed it. Well, I really feel like that we as world language educators have the responsibility and this opportunity that maybe other subject areas don't have. And that's to help students realize um, that they need the skill to relate to other cultures and diverse situations um, so that they can have an empathy and understanding of other people. Hmm. Okay. And what are some of the ways that you help the students to begin that journey and to be effective at it? I think one is to encourage them to start developing their own opinions, um, to not criticize their opinions, to let them know it's okay to have certain opinions. Um, It's very important to me that they realize why they've developed um, those ideas and those opinions um, over the years. And then through readings, through movies, through news articles, through conversation and questions, have them question why they believe what they believe. Have them question themselves about how they came to that opinion. 
And it may or may not change while they're with me, but at least they're thinking and, and trying to develop their thoughts for themselves. Now, Lisa, this happens within a classroom, and I'm actually going to go in two directions. I'm going to go, so I'll warn you, I'm going in the direction <laughs> of it's happening in a classroom, which by definition has quite a few young people in it, and it's happening in a classroom which is dedicated to the learning of a new language. Help me to understand how it is that you help the student to discover this and do it with many students present and do it while growing the language? I think sometimes it's okay to begin in your own language so that one can express themselves. Okay. Um, I ask them to journal, especially with scary topics such as immigration or um, religions and those types of things. But I also may give them um, a topic and give them what their belief set is just so that they can debate it and not necessarily have to show their true feelings or their true opinions, mm -hmm. just to come up with arguments that maybe someone might have in support of what they've been given of the idea that's on their card. Lisa, this is a strong beginning that you have had in this conversation, having to do with opinions and emotions and belief systems. Why is this important to you? What is, where is this coming from in your history? Well, I think some of it stems from the fact that I went to a school from kindergarten until the end of my sophomore year that I saw no cultural diversity. Mm. There were no people of color. We all looked alike. Um, most of us were from farm families or parents who were in manufacturing, mm -hmm. maybe a few educators, mm -hmm. but basically our histories were very similar. And our life story was very similar. And I had a civics teacher who introduced us to all of these other things, to different ideas and religions and peoples of the world. And I wanted to know more, being from this small school of less than 200 students in seventh through 12th grade. Wow. Yeah. And I knew there had to be something else out there. And I wanted to know more. And I think some of what I do in my classroom spills over from that experience. And that I want my students to always have more and more opportunity than I had. It certainly does spill over. That's a phenomenal story. And there we have again an educator that's really made a difference in a life. What were the ways that you grew and that you came out of that small school setting to follow some of that desire? I think it was a long time before I actually had the real opportunity to grow. Um, I had never really traveled out of the five state area of Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, West Virginia, until I was 28 years old. Mm. I'd never been on a plane. Um, I'd never dreamed of traveling anywhere. I'd read books and watched movies. And I was suddenly given the opportunity to travel to Germ Germany through the Rotary Group Study Exchange. Okay. And it was such an eye-opening experience. Tell us about some of the aspects of what was so eye and apparently heart-opening for you. Definitely heart-opening. Um, I was very naive. I was very innocent, especially within my experiences. And we were told as a team that everyone that we would come into contact with in Germany would speak English and that we didn't have to worry about knowing German. <laughs> and now looking back on that, I realized what an arrogant viewpoint that was. Uh and how inconsiderate and rude it was to assume 
that I was going to someone else's country to their home and expecting them to accommodate me with wow. my language. Wow. And of course, when I got there, that was not the experience. And fortunately, fortunately for me, the first host family that I lived with, they had lived in the States and they knew this was not going to be the experience um, with all the families. So my presentation, they helped me to translate to German uh -huh. so that I could pass it out in meetings. And they taught me a few basic phrases just to help me out. And obviously realizing how naive <laughs> I was to believe <laughs> this at this point, I also started studying the dictionary um, maybe five months later than I should have to learn some basic words and phrases so that I could correspond and communicate with people. Wow. You know, that's very interesting. You you use these phrases so arrogant to expect to come to someone else's home and to have them bend to you. That was, sounds like it was very formational for the work that you've done since then. You know, absolutely. Um, I think as many Americans unfortunately do just because of our situation in that we don't have a lot of countries that surround us that speak multiple languages. And we can travel for hours in any one direction. And everyone can communicate with each other easily. We just don't have or see the need mm. maybe to understand another language. I think we do have the need to understand other cultures and we don't recognize that. But after having that experience, even here within the States, I started thinking about that. When you go to someone else's home, when you go to another state, when you visit another school, you need to know a little bit about the history and the culture of those people to help you understand and make that connection and to form a relationship with our, within all of these situations. So it's not just traveling to an exotic foreign land, you say? Correct. Absolutely not. Fascinating. Now, you know, Lisa, coming back to your origins, so many of the folks that are in these podcasts or are engaged in world language education in particular have had backgrounds where they have come from larger areas, their exposure was to multiple cultures, probably, or they had some opportunities. So from the point of view of your origin, it relates a lot to the kinds of students that, for example, I taught who felt that they were never going to go anywhere, use language in any way, see the world in any way. So you're bringing a perspective from your life to your students that a lot of people don't have. Tell us a little bit more about how you have found your niche from your background and what you've been able to do for your students that others might not have been able to do. Right. And living in the area that I live in, not all of the schools in our district are affluent. And so, you know, sometimes students don't get the opportunities to travel. And unfortunately, sometimes I don't get to take as many students as I would like to with me. Mm -hmm. But definitely, I felt like it was my responsibility, not just within my school that already had a strong travel program when I first began working there, but to make sure that that travel program continued. But I also wanted to see other schools in the district and from the region to also have the same opportunity. But because this trip for me, that someone gave me the opportunity to travel, changed my life. Wow. And although um, the school trips, you know, through travel companies, they see a lot of the tourist places and, and things like that, I'm still hoping it'll touch their heart in some way that they'll actually want to go back and spend time either in college or sometime later in their life and actually immerse themselves in, in the culture somehow as an individual. So I'm hoping to spark something there 
Um, also, I believe in paying it forward. There was a lady who was the one that introduced me to the, the Rotary Group Exchange program. Okay. And had she never mentioned this and helped me through the process, I would have never had that opportunity. So I also felt like not just taking my students was an important endeavor, but each time that I've traveled, I've tried to take a different adult who has never had that opportunity. Interesting. And they in turn have started their own travel programs. And, and that makes my heart happy that people are continuing to spread those opportunities to other people. Lisa, one of the things that I notice uh, is that you are very fond of mentoring, that the concept of mentoring, what you're doing with students and also what you're doing with other adults, including the parents and so forth. Talk a little bit about the nature of helping to understand, helping others to understand language and culture from the point of view of mentoring. What does that do? I'm not sure that I can actually answer the question about what a mentor is because I've never really seen myself as a mentor. Hmm. But what I do see is that it's important to model what you would like to see happen in any situation. And so if you want teachers to, to show good practices or to have good practices in their classroom, then you yourself have to be willing to learn new practices uh -huh. and to implement them into your classroom. The same with travel. Um, if you want others to continue to, continue to travel once you're gone, you have to help them take that step. So I'm not sure that I'm a mentor, but I do try to lead by example, and I hope I'm leading in the right direction. Sometimes I get it wrong, but then again, you have to admit when you get it wrong. What do you think is the biggest thing that you model for others? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah. I hope hard work pays off and I hope that's what I model and that you don't do things to receive recognition. You do something because it's the right thing to do. As a teacher, I do things because it's the right thing to do for my students. It's going to better them in some way. It's going to better a situation for them in some way. And I hope that's what others see in me um, when they're watching me. And I hope that's what comes across in everything that I do. That I'm there for the students and I'm there for the program. And I will fight for that program and for the students and for my school division and for my colleagues. It's a powerful statement. Thank you very much. Now, let's think back to the background that you have. And part of what became you was exposing yourself to different kinds of people, folks that you had not grown up with and around. And one of the things that you have said to me is that we're afraid of what we don't know and we don't understand. We're afraid of that. How have you worked in your life on that part with your background? And how do you share that with especially students who are studying language and culture? I think always in the back of my mind is the question, why? Why do people do what they do? Why do people say what they say? Why do they behave the way that they do? And I think the underlying thing is that we all have a story. Mm -hmm. We all have a story to tell, and we all have a story that we want somebody else to hear. And although we're afraid of the unknown, if we will just take the time to sit and to listen 
and to initiate the conversation and ask why. I think we find that we have things in common, that we have more commonalities than differences in our lives, whether it be someone from another country, um, someone from a different background, someone of a different age. I think if we write or if we ask the correct questions and listen to each other's stories, we can find that common bond. That's phenomenally said. And when you went from feeling this important issue of the commonality of humanity, from your background, you were coming from a love of cultures and histories and so forth. When you come to the language classroom, in particular, along with the culture, how do you have students express this understanding through the learning of language? I think, once again, is having them do research. Ah. Having them ask the questions or sometimes asking them tough questions. Why do you think? Or what's the history behind this particular idea? Okay. Um, when you're talking about a country or a people or, you know, a background. And I'm not sure that I have a great answer for that. Um, because I think it, each situation lends itself to a different learning opportunity. No question. When you are out and about, you are been you are active in many, many associations in a leadership position, supervisory, the World Language Organization of Virginia, department chair, and so forth. How do you provide the approach that you're talking about, the invitation? What what are some of the aspects that you share in those leadership positions with other teachers that you come across so that they can begin to open up their programs and their approaches? I'm going to use the vow situation as an example. I didn't seek to be a member of vows initially. I'm kind of like my Spanish teaching um, career. That was not my, what I set out to do. Um, but our assistant superintendent was looking for someone to attend. And I said, I will go if you need somebody to attend. Now, this is the Virginia uh, World Language Supervisors, correct? Yes. And becoming a member of VALS was probably one of the best career choices I could have ever made in that I have met folks of like mine who could mentor me, but also who could provide information that we in Region 7 and in Washington County didn't have access to because we don't have supervisors oh. in our region. Uh -huh. So that allowed us to have contact people from all over the state who could answer questions for us. So then I could share that information which then people become more involved, I believe, when they have information at hand that they didn't know existed. So they've got a lot of information, then they're able to apply it by thinking and working together? Yes, thinking and working together and knowing that if they don't have the answer um, to how to do something or about where to find information or about professional development opportunities in world languages that we now have contacts all over the state that we can reach out to who are more than willing to assist us and help us find the information that we're searching for. Very powerful. When you take a look, Lisa, at Again, the background that you've come from, the history of your family and of your own growth and learning in this, what message do you especially have for those that say, be it students or sometimes educators, 
I can't do that. I don't have the background, the talent, the opportunity, the smarts, even sometimes, as I've heard my students say, how do we overcome that? You know, I think in life, it's very easy to allow ourselves to feel inferior. Um, I know coming from the region that I've grown up in, that could have been very easy for myself. And at times I have felt inferior, um, as I'm sure other folks have and have those insecurities. But I've also been given many opportunities in life. And I think what I've learned, and I hope others will come to understand and realize, is that when an opportunity arrives, to accept it and accept it in that moment. It may not feel like it's the best time in your life. You may feel that you're inadequately equipped to handle the opportunity or what comes with in the situation in that opportunity. Um, you may feel that there are other people who are better candidates and who are more intelligent or have more skill than you have. And of course, going back to the being afraid of the unknown, we may be afraid to take that opportunity, but call it fate or karma or whatever you want to call it in your life, that opportunity has arrived for you. It's been given to you and you need to accept it because those opportunities can bring good things to your life, as well as other people around you. Do you think that in the study of language and culture, there are opportunities available for young people and for adults that might not be found in other directions? Absolutely. We have the opportunity to develop a skill set that many aren't willing to try, that aren't willing to learn another language. But as we all know, the World Language Classroom isn't just about learning language. It's, it's learning culture and how to communicate. And I think we as world language teachers help students to develop their skills. Mm -hmm. And going back to the cultural intelligence, hopefully help them find that cultural intelligence so that they can learn to relate to other people, whether it be in the workforce, whether it be in another country, and to learn how to offer empathy and understanding um, to other people in the world. Have you ever experienced a transformational moment in a student's life any, or the, any story that you might be able to tell that's an example of watching a young person grow from this approach that you've just explained, bringing the world more to their attention? I remember a particular student who maybe didn't have the skill set in the classroom, or at least had not reached that skill set yet while he was in Spanish in high school. And several years, five or 10 years after he graduated from high school, I got an email, as did his other Spanish teacher. Um, there were three of us at the time and two of us had taught him, thanking us for the skills that he had developed in our class. He had gone into the Navy and the little bit of foundation that he had, plus learning about other countries and cultures, had helped him succeed in the Navy. Wow. And it's those types of stories. Um, kids emailing later who have decided to study abroad, who have decided to live abroad, um, who finally found themselves while they're living abroad are the ones that touch your heart the most. I can well imagine so. Why do you think that they indeed found themselves while living, working, or traveling abroad? 
I think, again, living in a small community with a lack of diversity, I think some people, especially young people, are craving the opportunity to see various sides of themselves. And when you live in a small community with a lack of diversity, I'm not sure that they get to develop that within themselves until they get to experience more in life and more viewpoints in life. Mm -hmm. Then it begins to reflect on themselves. Sounds like your pathway to teaching language despite your intention not to, has been, <laughs> has been a very rich experience for you. Do you ever regret having gone in the direction of language instead of staying with the, the history that you first planned on? Absolutely not. I'm going back to these opportunities. Um, I'll even jokingly say that maybe this was a forced op opportunity <laughs> um, to land in the world language world. But it absolutely is where I belong. There has not been a single year that I have not enjoyed everything that I do. Um, there are very few days that I can say, even in this challenging time, that I don't enjoy what I do, especially when I get to interact with the kids. Powerful. And that means, of course, that they also are benefiting from that commitment and that understanding as a model from you. And I thank you for it, Lisa. I'm going to actually invite you now to turn visually as it towards the folks that are listening to this podcast. What would you like to say here as we wrap up as the invitation, exhortation, the last very important thing that you want to make sure that they know that you're burning to tell them before we end today? I think one thing is I want everyone to remember that everyone has something of value to contribute to life, to a conversation, to a situation. Back to, I think that everyone has a story. Take time to listen to their story. A lot of times it helps us understand and have more empathy with why they're responding to a situation in the way that they are. And also, I feel like I'm going to use a quote by Robert Smith that he made during a commencement speak at um, to the Morehouse graduating class of 2019. And in that speech, he said, treat all people with dignity, even if you can't see how they're going to help you. That's powerful, Lisa. That dignity, that appreciation, and that growth comes out in everything that you say, and certainly all the things that you've been doing for students and for your many appreciative colleagues. Thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful, and I wish you the very best, especially in these challenging times. Thank you, and thank you for being such a great mentor over the years. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. Let's continue the conversation. Be sure to check out my website, fluencyonline.com, to learn more about our guests and to check out the resources and information they've shared with us there. I have other ideas, resources, and opportunities there for you too. Again, thanks so much for listening. And until next time.